Welcome to the Plastic Pollution Coalition monthly webinar series, where we bring together our global community to share the latest information, tips, and resources to help stop the expanding plastic pollution crisis. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a growing global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations, businesses, and leaders in 75 countries working to educate, connect, and advocate for a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution. We'd like to thank our partner, the Conrad Foundation, who continually empowers students around the world to create a sustainable future for all. We'd like to give a warm welcome to our participants and particularly students joining us today from the Conrad Challenge, which is the Conrad Foundation's annual innovation and entrepreneurship competition of high school student teams. If you haven't heard of them, please check it out at conradchallenge.org. Here are a few tips before we get started. We invite you to participate in our poll questions. We are going to turn off the chat now, so please share your questions in the Q&A section. And if you would like to share on social, please be sure to tag us and please tag our awesome presenters. Okay, let's get started. We have three poll questions to help us get to know you and your interests. And you're going to have 20 seconds to respond to each question and then we'll share the results. Poll question number one, tell us more about yourself. Please select all that apply. Wow, lots of students students and concerned citizens. Looks like we've got some aquanauts and divers and marine biologists on this, wonderful. Concerned citizens, policymakers, welcome. Business, organizations and NGOs, researchers, academics and scientists, teachers and professors and students. Fantastic, thank you. Let's go on to poll question number two. Where are you joining us from today? It looks like the majority of participants are coming from North America, quite a few from Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. Looks like we have folks on this from everywhere. Not so much from the Middle East. It may be the middle of the night there though. All right, let's move on to poll question number three. What interested you in this webinar? And please select all that apply. Awesome. Well, we have a very curious, uh, Webinar attendees, thank you all so much. The majority of folks on the call are interested in ending plastic pollution. Me too, right on. Thank you very much for participating in our poll. And let's get started. Today I am honored, deeply honored and very excited to moderate our webinar, Deep Ocean to Outer Space, Plastic Pollution Solutions, featuring our esteemed panelists, both of whom have established many firsts in their respective life's work so far. Dr. Sylvia Earle, President and Chairman of Mission Blue and a National Geographic Society Explorer in Residence, and Dr. Catherine Sullivan, Charles Lindbergh Chair of Aerospace History at the Smithsonian Institution. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to share your questions and again, upvote questions from other attendees that you'd also like to see us answer and we'll do our best to get to them. First, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Sylvia Earle. Dr. Sylvia Earle is the president and chairman of Mission Blue and a National Geographic Society Explorer in residence, as I said. She is called her deepness by the New Yorker and the New York Times, living legend by the Library of Congress and first hero for the planet by Time Magazine. She is an oceanographer, explorer, author, and lecturer with a lifetime of experience in field research science as a government official and director for corporate and nonprofit organizations. In 1970, Sylvia led Tektite 2, the first all woman underwater research team living off the coast of St. John. She walked on the ocean floor at 1,250 feet untethered in 1979 and was the first woman chief scientist of NOAA from 1990 to 1992. Sylvia founded Mission Blue to create hope spots by protecting large ocean areas around the world, and she is dedicated to protecting the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. Here is a trailer to a film to help introduce Sylvia to you. I see things that others do not. A different world. A world that's changed enormously just in my lifetime. My backyard was the Gulf of Mexico. 
That's where I first fell in love with the ocean. And I think if others had the opportunity to witness what I have seen in my lifetime from thousands of hours underwater, I would not seem like a radical at all. It's a pleasure to introduce a scientist, an engineer, a teacher, and an explorer. The ocean is dying. All of us, we are the beneficiaries of having burned through fossil fuels. But at what cost? 60 years ago, when I began exploring the ocean, no one imagined that we could do anything to harm it. I saw the after influence of what we can do to the natural world. Think of the world without an ocean. You've got a planet a lot like Mars. No ocean, no life. No ocean, no us. In 1990, she became the chief scientist for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I went to one meeting, and I was never allowed to go again. <laughs> I feel that I must resign and, as a private citizen, do what I can do with more freedom. She's not afraid to say, you know, you know what you're doing and it's wrong. I really speak for the ocean. If we continue business as usual, we're in real trouble. She's made it her life's purpose to make sure everybody else understands what's going on. Sylvia has a wish for the planet, what she calls her mission blue. Protect the ocean in the same way we now protect the land. I wish for a global network of marine protected areas to save and restore the ocean. Now it's my also my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan has a long career as a distinguished scientist, astronaut, and executive. She was one of the first women to join the NASA Astronaut Corps in 1978 and holds the distinction of being the first American woman to walk in space. Her submersible dive in the Challenger Deep in June of this year, 2020, made her the first person to both orbit the planet and reach its deepest point, as well as the first woman to dive to full ocean depth. Kathy is the most vertical person in the world, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. Dr. Sullivan was Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Administrator of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration from March 2014 to January 2017. Following completion of her service at NOAA, she was designated as the 2017 Charles A. Lindbergh Chair of Aerospace History at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum, and has also served as a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Here is a short film about her dive to the Mariana Trench. Hello, I'm Dr. Kathy Sullivan, scientist, astronaut, and explorer. I grew up fascinated by maps and wanting to have a chance to travel all over the world, not just as a tourist, but to really come to understand our planet. So it was an incredible delight in late 2019 when Victor Vescovo emailed me. Uh, he'd built himself a submersible and a ship that allowed him to dive to the deepest point in each of the five world's oceans in 2019. And now he was going to do some more expeditions in 2020. And he thought the time had come for a female scientist to get to see the Marianas Trench, the Challenger Deep, the deepest point in the world's ocean, firsthand. So leaving the planet as, a, as an astronaut is an intense and explosive and brief event. It's eight and a half minutes of riding a bomb. And diving to the Challenger Deep, in contrast, is a slow and elegant elevator ride. Uh, the limiting factor submersible takes four hours to descend through the, the seven miles of ocean to the bottom of the trench. <music> We 
had plenty comfortable little seats, sort of like an economy class airline seat. We took a moment to grab some of our lunch at about 33,000 feet so that we wouldn't be hungry and we wouldn't be, not be trying to deal with sandwiches and flying at the same time. And then finally, about exactly four hours after we began our descent from the surface, uh, we could see sediment coming up as our thrusters slowed us a little bit. Very fine grain, like fine talcum powder suspended in the, in the water column. Uh, and then softly, poof, we're on the bottom. And I remember Victor said, here you are. Welcome to the bottom of the world. There are fascinating similarities and differences between flying in space and making a dive like this to the deepest parts of the ocean. The, the core thing that's similar to me is how marvelous and almost magical it is. Not magic at all, it's thanks to exquisite engineering, but how magical it feels to be sitting inside a small craft, usually just dressed in street clothes we might wear on Earth, and feeling completely normal and quite safe, and yet looking out a window or a viewport to an environment that I know is absolutely lethal for me. I'm completely tickled to hold uh, these, these records and never, I never imagined that I would hold any Guinness World Records. Uh, and so to discover that just because I had the good fortune of being invited along on Victor's expedition that I now will be awarded three Guinness World Records is, it's, it's remarkable. It's, uh, it really does sort of blow me away. It, so I'm actually thinking I'll have a little challenge coin made up to give away to young people I speak to going forward that, that has the you know, most vertical person in the world on it or something like that so that I can pass, I hope, some of, this, some of the inspiration, some of the excitement, some of the wonder of the experience that I had on the Ring of Fire expedition. Uh, leave a little token of that with young people that I encounter in, in hopes that, that they too uh, will think about the wonder and the fun and the reward of building themselves a career that's inquisitive and adventurous and challenges and probes new frontiers. These grand quests and adventures, they are, they're, worth, they're worth the effort, they're worth your investment. So find something that really fires your passion and the satisfaction you will get out of it is beyond compare. So, you know, reach for the stars and work hard because it's hard work is the only thing that turns the stardust of dreams into concrete reality. Let's go into our questions and get started. So, to begin, um, I'd just like to say that you are both <laughs> incredibly accomplished scientists contributing to New Frontiers. And this is really a question for both of you. And um, I, either one of you could go first, but I wanted to ask you what changes or impacts you've seen in the increase of plastic uh, in the ocean in particular and in our coastlines, but just around us in general. So as a, maybe this is a question to start with Sylvia. Changes, I think, since I began splashing around in the ocean in the 1950s, there are two remarkable things. One, how much we've learned. So much that we didn't know and could not know until right about now about the nature of the ocean and why it matters to everyone, everywhere, all the time. We just kind of took the ocean for granted and did not think that humans could harm the ocean but the other big thing that's happened since the middle of the 20th century is how much harm we have caused, both from what we have taken out of the ocean, but to the point of this conversation, what we put in. During my first dives in the Gulf of Mexico and later all over the world, I plastics, I just 
didn't see any. There, there wasn't even a con. I mean, the, they barely had come into practical use in the 1950s. But just imagine in a few decades how they've come to dominate our li lives, <laughs> dominate our, our world, dominate the ocean too. They are useful in so many ways. We're talking about synthetic products. I think plastics are here to stay one way or the other. And that is really not the problem. The problem is what we do with them when we're through with them or think we're through with them. We're never through with them because they don't go away. They're part of, <laughs> part of the planet. They're part of the universe. Synthetic materials that did not, do not exist in nature. And they can break down into smaller and smaller bits, but because of the nature of most plastics, they, they, they have great integrity right down to the molecular level. So plastics may look as though they have broken down into little pieces and have no longer, are no longer a problem. But the fact is they're more of a problem at the nano and micro level almost than they are when they're big and you can pick them up and do something with them. But just think of what has happened. Now, everywhere I go, and I know it's true with Kathy as well, where she goes underwater, it's hard to escape collision, contact, being immersed in, in a soup that now includes not just what should be there, life, plankton, fish, sponges, all those great things, but also these synthetic materials that are now pervasive. Mm -hmm. And Kathy? Yeah, I guess, I mean, never try to speak more eloquently than Sylvia about an issue like this, but uh, you know, I have found it useful to offer people some other perspectives to maybe try to relate, because this seems to many people, a, a distant and sort of esoteric issue. Uh, but most of us, most of us of pretty well any age, uh, can we can do an analog experiment. Just think about what roadways that you drive along frequently look like and how you've seen them change through your lifetime. Uh, because I think we all know some highway, some road we're pretty familiar with that has an increasing amount of plastic uh, debris along the edge of it, bags or straws or somebody's food wrapper, you know, what, whatever it is. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of trend that's happening also in the ocean. Uh, in the ocean, it's, it's accentuated for a lot of reasons, but it, a chief one being anything that we lose or drop or dispose of carelessly. I live in Columbus, Ohio. How could that affect the ocean? But, you know, a plastic debris that I'm careless about here will end up in the Scioto River and then the Ohio River and then the Mississippi River. So rivers are aggregators that funnel the effects of many of us out into the one common blue area known as our ocean. I just would offer a couple other points. And again, Sylvia teed these up brilliantly. One aspect of this kind of challenge always is the problem you can't see. And, and getting your head around and then getting some practical responses around the scope and impact of the thing you can't see. Uh, so we can't see, most of us, most of the plastic debris in the ocean. Maybe if we beach comb, we can pick some things up. But these smaller and smaller fragments, even when, we, even when to us they seem terribly, terribly small, they're large enough to block the gullet of a fish or an animal. They're large enough to accumulate and fill the stomach uh, of a sea creature that then, can, then ends up malnourished. So it might not be that, it is not all the damage being done by entanglement and it is not all the damage being done by choking. It can be by malnutrition, it can be by many, many things. And one final point that I was really, I was very surprised to learn as I did uh, my research before going out on the Challenger Deep Expedition in June, I looked through the scientific literature, at the results of biological studies that the Caledon Oceanic team and other scientific teams, uh, the work they've done on fish, uh, jellyfish, creatures from the deepest parts of the ocean, 20,000 feet and deeper, all the way down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Mm -hmm. These trenches are hundreds of miles away from any of us and miles and miles deep. And you would think, 
surely if there's some place on this planet that our hand and our influence has managed to not yet reach, surely it would be there. And microplastics are found in the guts of the deepest deep sea critters, even from these most remote environments. Uh, and what that brought home to me as I was again doing my research was something I know from my spaceflight experience, but this was another, you know, a vivid example from another dimension. And it, and it, is, it is this punchline. There is no place anywhere at all on this planet that is not intimately connected to every single living thing on this planet, including you, wherever you live, whatever your zip code. Uh, it's the interconnections are what make this place the habitable planet that we uh, currently enjoy. And they are what we must be mindful of uh, mm -hmm. if we're gonna help steward it and sustain it as a habitable planet. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're, you're both reminding me too, I remember our friend Mike Degree, who I met on the first Mission Blue with you, Sylvia, um, he was very excited. I looked back when he, he, he passed away, he died tragically in an accident, but I looked at the conversations he and I had been having, and he was so excited about going in these deep, deep sea uh, uh, submarines and being able to film. And he was telling me, oh, I've got this incredible footage from the Mediterranean. You're not going to believe how much plastic pollution and garbage is on the bottom of the seafloor there. And uh, that was the, the last, you know, engagement I had with him. But I did get to see some of that footage. And it's, I think that we have been thinking of the ocean as vast and limitless uh, and it may be in the same way that we think of space, in a sense. And well, and, and historically in the United States in, in its settlement period, how we thought about rivers. Uh, we built cities turning their rear end to the rivers so that whatever uh, waste or discharge came out of the tanning factory or the hide factory or whatever, just dump it in the river because it just, it just goes away and it doesn't bother us anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. it, ignoring that it passes through so many other environments, human environments, other people, other organisms, and ends up concentrated in the sea where these rivers dump out. Yeah, we're changing the chemistry of the ocean, therefore our life support system uh, at our peril. Yeah. yeah, there's you know there's no astronaut in the world that would not take extremely good care of the life support system on their spaceship, master <laughs> it completely, know everything about it, and never take the least bit of it for granted. Uh, what we're failing on all three of those counts when it comes to the natural systems that are the life support system that we depend on. Spaceship Earth. Yeah, and Kathy, yeah, very much. Way, way back in the way back in the 80s, I was made aware, I didn't have a clue, but I was made aware of some of the the things that we're putting up in space would sometimes, you know, they little things would chip off, little tiny fragments, and be zooming around at what eighteen thousand some right about that. Yep. <laughs> and and they they then become hazards. A tiny little chip of paint traveling well, that fast. You know, let, let me share something. Uh, this might be a good time, you think, Diana? Yeah. Uh, Sylvia, you're exactly right. And just on your point, uh, here's, here's some statistics. If you had a little piece of something the size of a poppy seed in orbit and it hit you, you would feel like you'd been hit with a 90 mile an hour baseball. And there are tens of millions of those racing around the planet. You can't see them. You can't track them. You're going to know if they hit you. Uh, but that's it. And here are some other ones. So, you know, imagine being hit by a blueberry and it feels like an anvil and there's millions of those, tens of thousands of plums, which are like <laughs> being hit by a bus and, you know, thousands and thousands of softballs. Uh, all, all of these things are so small, we cannot track them from the earth. So, you know, there is a cloud around the earth of these tens of millions of poppy seeds to softballs, you know they can be pretty doggone hazardous to you or your spacecraft if they hit you. 
and you don't know where they are. It's like just being in a statistical fog, uh, but they are there and they can definitely imperil you. And, and this really in a way quite similar to what we're talking about with the ocean, uh, this too is sort of a tragedy of the commons. If you think the ocean seems vast, space has always seemed endlessly vast. Uh, and you know, within our lifetime, Sylvia, there were only two countries that had any capability to put anything into space. So the right. place is really huge and it's only you and me. So how much harm can we do? Well, mm -hmm. the, the low earth environment, uh, up to say a thousand miles around earth is so congested nowadays, it's becoming a question. It's becoming potentially a, a cloud you can't get through to put the next satellite right. up or to get astronauts safely back and forth to orbit. And in the space arena, we're wrestling with very many of the same challenges we face in the ocean. I only put my rocket up there. I'm not responsible for the rest. There wasn't a rule I had to follow. Uh, you know, whose, whose place is this when it is all of our place? It kind of ends up becoming nobody's place. And somebody and just wants, and everybody's, but this, but a person who just wants to make use of it uh, cavalierly and go on their merry way, uh, there's, you know, there's no restraint other than our, you know, our civic ethos, our, our agreements of how we wish to live together on this planet, some of which we put into laws, but some of which are just, you know, an ethos we live by. Uh, that's very much where we are on the space debris issue. And it's got a lot of similarities to the oceanic plastic issue. Uh, Kathy and Sylvia, would you mind if we took a moment to just show a, a two minute piece from NASA, it's an animation, and maybe you could just explain what we're looking at, Kathy, yeah. while we watch that. Sure, I think it's a really good one to give you a sense to. So you're seeing, there's the Earth in the middle, the bright dot, uh, and the, the sort of horizon around it is the geostationary orbit. And you see how many, I think you're gonna plunge into here, you'll get a sense of how many satellites are running around everywhere. Now you're flipping around, you're gonna see the equator, see what looks like an actual belt around the middle. That's where all the geostationary satellites are. That's 22,300 miles from Earth. So now that's not considered low Earth orbit. Now we're zooming in and we're coming down to that sort of thousand mile cloud that I was talking about. And you can see, uh, and this, these are the objects you can track. These are not the poppy seeds and plums that I told you about. These are the things that are sort of the size of a laptop or bigger. And there are tens of thousands of those, and we kind of know where they are. And mathematically, if you're going to fly through them, we can you can get a big supercomputer and calculate uh, what the odds are of getting through safely. Uh, but again, that ignores the the poppy seeds and plums. But just to give you a sense of uh, you know these are not all active satellites. Some of them are dead satellites that are just still orbiting around. Their orbit has not decayed. Um, it's a couple of decades ago, the spacefaring countries at that time made an agreement that when you launch a new satellite, you'll put enough fuel on it so that when it's coming to the end of its useful life, you'll be able to drop it from that orbit and you know, <laughs> here we go, splash it safely in the ocean. Uh, you know, most, most of these things will burn up in the atmosphere before they reach the ocean, but you bring them in over the ocean in case any little bits uh, are still around that you won't uh, kill someone on land. Um, but you know, that's you know, these little dots you're seeing here are not going to be swept out by that agreement. They're just going to stay there until very slowly their orbit decays. And if something the size of a laptop hits something the size of a kitchen table at these speeds, instead of two objects you can see and track, you will end up with an exploded cloud of thousands of objects that are smaller than those two. Maybe, maybe 20 or 30 will still be large enough to track and the rest will be down in that realm of softballs and plums and blueberries, small fragments that are out there, another debris cloud uh, that will disperse itself through space and become more of the untrackable but super dangerous debris. It's so interesting to me that this, I really feel like there's a mirror going on when I first learned about what was happening in space and space debris, and then made that kind of comparison connection to marine debris. But what's, what we've seen with marine debris is that 70 to 90% of it is plastic. Yeah, that's it. 
and so uh, I, I thought I might um, go back to you, Sylvia, and ask like the difference that you've seen from, and, and could, could you talk a bit about your experience going into Tektite with your crew there and just what you saw at that time versus what you're seeing returning to some of those same locations now? Well, what I did see in the 1970s were lots of sharks, lots of fish, lots of lobsters, lots of life. What I didn't see, plastic. <laughs> but this is more recently. This is just a few years ago in a protected area of the ocean around Cocos, the Cocos Islands, which they're 300 miles offshore from Costa Rica. You see, it's not all plastic. It's a habitat. Look at the fish gathered under it. Uh, fishermen know that if you put something in the ocean, fish and other creatures are attracted to it. It becomes, they call them fish aggregating devices, fads. And it's become a very sophisticated way in recent times of catching fish. Poor innocent things, they don't know. They see something floating out there. They, through the ages, are accustomed to things like coconuts. You see one there, or rafts of vegetation. And it's shelter in the open sea. Well, think of the, think of the habitats, that we, the islands in the ocean that we have now created by putting all this junk in the ocean. So we've kind of distorted the natural arrangement of things, in part because many of these materials are not just places to set up housekeeping or find shelter, they're also toxic. And of course, when they do break down and get nibbled on by everything from copepods to <laughs> the fish and the fish that eat the fish and therefore ingest the plastics right up the food chain, um, you know, we're changing the nature of the ocean, but it's interesting to think that when you try to get rid of the plastic by scooping it out of the ocean, you're also taking a lot of life along with it. So it's, it's kind of a tragic bycatch. So here is one of the famous albatrosses, live a long time, produce, uh, they, they mate, tend to mate for life, produce one egg every year or so. This one has decided, well, plastic junk looks like home to me. But the terrible thing is that little baby, when it hatches from the egg, is then confronted with this gauntlet of plastic. And worse, when mom and dad go out to sea and, and capture what they think is yum yum squid or small fish, they also capture bits of plastic. It deliberately looks like you know, a little bottle cap looks like something edible. They scoop it up and then they stuff it down the goozle of the baby bird. And a large percentage of the offspring of albatrosses, where this picture was taken at Midway Island, halfway across the Pacific Ocean, and many other places where seabirds gather, feeding their young bits of plastic, nesting in beaches where they have few choices left because they're so crowded with plastic. What's a bird going to do? See, if a bird, you're flying by, you can't find that much squid these days because we're taking the squid. It's a double whammy for the birds. We, we're taking what they eat and we're giving them something that is inedible as a substitute. It's actually deadly. So a lot of this stuff winds up stuffing birds large and small, really a hazard for them and fish too. And then this final picture is of me taking a bath in plastic. It's also... You know, Cocos Island, way out there in the ocean. There's a, a few people, park service people living on the island, but they're not the origin of this. I was, I was really struck on the occasion when this picture was taken because not only this stuff was there, but there was a kitchen sink. It was a big plastic kitchen sink. They say everything but the kitchen sink. Well, we had that too. <laughs> not to laugh about, but there it was. Anyway. That's the current reality. And it sinks. That's the other thing. Some people have the impression that, you know, it's light. It's, it floats. It's just up there. It doesn't bother. But eventually, partly because it, it, it takes, some of it takes in water, like the styrofoam bits, but also it gathers enough stuff growing on it that it sinks. And 
I've seen plastic, you know, like Kathy, I've been out in little submersibles far below where you can dive. And, and I have yet in the last 20 years of many submersible dives, I, I have always seen trash of one sort or another, most of it plastic. Yeah. You know, thousands of feet beneath the surface. So it's not just up here. And you can't just get rid of it by scooping from the surface and taking all this little fish along with it. Oh, by the way, you know, it's a real problem. We just didn't think it through when we started producing single use plastics, particularly. Yeah. There is no way. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. And it must have been just so different to, to go out and live underwater like that and tektite too. It must have. Oh, you become more like a sea creature. You, you're there day and night. You watch the sun come up from underwater. You, 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 watch, you can see the stars when you're 20 meters or so underwater on a clear, calm day or night. And it's, you get to know individual fish. That was one of the transformative things for me. You, it's not just J random tuna <laughs> or whatever. It's that fish that lives there. And they tend to swim around with, with fish that are the same ones. You know, they, they have communities. They have, they have um, social structure. They certainly have language. Most fish make noise just like, well, I call it noise, sounds, <laughs> communication. Like dolphins and whales, we know about that, birds, but people don't think much about how fish communicate, but they do. Anyway. It's a different world now. Well, and so thank you for that. Um, Kathy, um, in, what's your impression in your different experiences going to space, uh, you know, of what it feels like? Because I, um, I, I feel so lucky to have you both and your, your experience and your observations, you know? Well, the... Uh there are a fascinating set of similarities and differences to the two experiences. The, uh, my favorite similarity is uh, the, the light of microgravity floating around inside your spaceship or, or in a spacesuit outside of it. Um, and that you can get a very close uh, approximation of if you scuba dive. If you get your, as a scuba diver, if you get your weights perfectly adjusted so that if you don't move, stop completely underwater, you won't be drifting to the surface or sinking to the bottom or tipping left or right. Uh, Sylvia and I know this uh, when we've scuba dived together, uh, we, we make everyone else on the dive boat absolutely crazy because they're cranking around and kicking and moving and you know, <laughs> moving too fast and throwing their limbs around and they're out of air in 35 to 45 minutes. And Sylvia and I can pretty well get an hour and 15 out of a tank of air because you know, I never move more than the tip of one flipper at a time. And <laughs> if I'm moving with my hands, it's like putting the tip of the finger on a rock and giving a gentle shove. What, depth, just, what depth are you at when you're I, it? You know, I, as a recreational diver, I've always set a pretty strict floor of 100 feet. And I've, I've occasionally maybe drifted 20 or feet or something deeper than that. But um, it, it starts to, it stops passing the bother to worth test or the risk reward test when you're just out for a recreational purpose. You know, if there's a scientific research dives or things like that, that would be a different matter. Uh, but just to go enjoy the company of fish and nudibranchs and other glorious creatures and take a stroll in the park, you know, 100, 100 feet is fine. And I'll spend actually most of my time probably in the 30 to 50 foot range. And uh, so Sylvia and I have been known to spend 30 or 40 minutes about 20 feet underwater looking at comb jellies and all the little lovely, because again, most of the people we dive with think that's the empty water you don't care about. Uh, it's because they're staring off into the distance looking for the gigantic 400 pound tuna that they, <laughs> and they get to swim with the charismatic megafauna and they completely miss this elegant gem that's about this big that's right in front of them. Uh, so, it's, you know, Sylvia and I are both envied, admired, and hated on dive boats. <laughs> <laughs> hate it because we stay too long underwater. 
<laughs> well, and, and then how does that also compare for you to space and your experience? I guess I'm asking well, you like what you love about this and how it makes you feel. Well, could I just jump in because Kathy, you don't have to worry about getting damaged by plastic coming at a jillion miles an hour, but up in space, I think of you out there doing your spacewalk with blueberries and poppy seeds. Yeah. Yep. Poppy seeds. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. That one really one scary. of those one of those hits your helmet and cracks your visor, you're in a world of hurt. Um, yep. But the you know what I love what what I love about so I, my background is oceanographer and earth scientist so that my my passion is the planet and how it works sort of the, the system of systems that this planet is uh, in its entirety uh, and and the largest and most significant system on the planet is the ocean um, so what's what entrances me endlessly about getting to be in space is that expansive and integrative view of the planet that you get. You can see a thousand miles in pretty well any every direction out of spacecraft window. You, you can't help but recognize how interconnected everything is. Uh, you also cannot help but see the hand of man even from hundreds of miles away and it's, it's a reminder uh, we, we may live on a, an, an Eden-like planet in, in its natural state, but when we, when we human beings settle on a purpose and muster energy around that purpose, we leave very evident, visible thumbprints, fingerprints, markings on this planet. The gray smudges of cities, uh, shipwakes and contrails, uh, sediment plumes going into rivers that you know are much larger than the natural sediment load because land has been cleared and more soil is is running off. And as a scientist, I would look in particular at those river plumes and yes, we're having puppy wars over here. Um, you know, maybe see a pretty tan plume of sediment spilling out into the Mediterranean, for example. But but. but but would know, you know, or would wonder in a way, what's, what's the chemical burden in that, excuse me, what's, what's the chemical burden in that pretty tan plume and how is that affecting the life in the sea? So that's what I love about space is it really brings home. <laughs> brings, that, that got rid of them. But what I love about the ocean is, uh, I mean, in the deep sea with a submersible, you can maybe see 30 feet if you've got a really powerful bank of lights. So you're not getting, you know, the Arthur C. Clarke view. But everywhere you look, uh, there's life in the ocean. And it is so uh, exquisitely varied and exquisitely adapted to so many unique environments. Many, you know, it, there's life in the sea in environments that when I was in grad school, we were positive could not support any kind of life at all. That, that's how extraordinary life, life is in general and life in the ocean. So, you know, the view is fabulous in one direction, your company, the company you keep is fabulous in the other direction. And I'm the extraordinarily lucky person that's got, didn't have to pick one or the other, but has gotten to do them both. <laughs> I think your view of the way that we have altered our little blue miracle in space is one thing, but imagine if we did not know what we now know because we have that view, both from high in the sky and from deep in the sea. There was a time not so long ago when it was thought there could not be life in the deep sea. It's too dark, it's too cold. The high pressure, it would be impossible for anything to live there. And now you, as a witness, we have, again, we. We have witnesses from high in the sky and deep in the sea. Well, that there, give are us whole, the... there are whole communities, not just single critters. The, the communities around the hydrothermal vents that you right. know, deep, dark, uh, is boiling hot. I mean, you try to take, stick a temperature probe into those dark smoker plumes, you'll melt the probe. And by the way, the water is acidic. It's weak sulfuric acid. That's, a, that's four for four, right? It's too deep, it's too dark, it's too doggone hot, and it's an acid bath for crying out loud. And there's not like a guy living there. There's whole no. communities of clams and worms and fish, all specialized 
to that environment and the bacteria uh, that they live with that makes the whole thing go. And as I said, when I started graduate school in 1973, it was like known as a fact that none of what I just described could possibly exist. That's right. And, and be, Within 10 years, everything changed. Totally changed. On this planet, we found that degree of, uh, of life form that we never imagined. And I promise you there are more of those, thousands more in the ocean that we just haven't seen yet. So by treating the ocean as if it doesn't matter, <laughs> Who needs the ocean? Now we know we all need the ocean and we need to do something about the problems we've unwittingly caused. And the, the plastic issue, who could have imagined that these wonderful products that enrich our lives and make life so convenient could possibly come back to haunt us in the many ways that they now do. And many people still are unaware that this is a problem, it is an issue. Thank you, Diana, for putting the spotlight on this as something that we now do have to think about because we can, we can't go back, but we can make things better by going forward armed with what we now know. I believe that we can. And I, I've been watching a lot of questions come in and uh, there was one that I think if you both felt like answering it, you could very quickly. People were interested to know the names of your pets. <laughs> I could do that one. Thank you for the hard, the really hard question. Yeah, uh, got a harder one after that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, the little guy I showed you is a two-year-old Havanese puppy named Murphy, uh, sleeping peacefully somewhere else in uh, in the room. Here is his father, uh, Vegas, and hiding <laughs> off somewhere in the back of the house is my very ancient cat, who's long given up on doing things like crawling up on laps and walking over tables. And her name is, her name is Sophie. Sophie. So, Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Seymour is, is around here somewhere, the big black cat. There's a black and white one, Annie. And there are three dogs at latest count. <laughs> it's, a, it's a shifting number. <laughs> we, my daughter, Liz, is a magnet. She is an everything whisperer. Horses, roosters, you know, you, yeah. you name it, we've probably got one or two around here somewhere. <laughs> What's the rooster's name? Oh, well, it depends on, <laughs> depends on, on, on we, we, we started calling him Mike because <laughs> the guy who gave us the rooster is named Mike. But he's also been known as Michelangelo because he likes to eat pine nuts and somehow there's a Italian, An Italian connection. connection. Yeah. But he, he's also been known as Michel. <laughs> okay. And anyway. My, my, very, my very favorite ever pet name, I, I have to tell you, it was semi-pet. It was a small Arctic fox that had been orphaned as a kit in, in the far northwest of Iceland, in a very remote area. And the family that ran a rustic hostel there took him in and raised him up and then tried to let him go back into the wild. But he'd gotten so imprinted and attuned the humans, he never strayed very far. Uh, we drove into that resort late one summer about 10 years ago, and the fox was skittering around the parking lot, looked like he wanted to kind of come over and say hi. So we asked about him when we went inside and got the story I just told you. And then I said, well, have you given him a name? And, it, and in, heavily in English, heavily accented by Icelandic, they said, well, of course. I said, what is it? They said, Michael J. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. <laughs> well, I don't want to divert too much, but 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 I have to tell you this one. It's no political overtones, but we had a cat named Miao Tse Tung. <laughs> All right. So the follow-up question to that is, uh, and this has been upvoted by 13 people who are on the webinar. What advice are you giving the Biden administration to ensure ocean health, particularly given the ocean's value to our global economy? Well, I think Biden has made a great choice in naming John Kerry for the climate chief. Uh, John Kerry, I don't know whether I've got this exactly right, but you can't solve the problems of climate without solving the ocean 
and vice versa. You can't solve the problems of the ocean without solving the climate issues. So he gets it, that the ocean and climate are like this. And when you think who needs the ocean, who doesn't need the ocean? We all do. It's not just about the economy, it's about our existence. I say it a lot that the most important thing that we extract from the ocean is our existence. We're here because Earth has an ocean. No ocean, no life. And it's not just the water, it's the life. As Kathy keeps pointing out, it's alive, it's alive. And so we're alive because it's alive. The more damage we do to the ocean, it's our life support system that's at risk. The other point I would make about Secretary Kerry's appointment, uh, I, I was the head of NOAA during the time that he was Secretary of State. And he uh, conceived of and initiated and pioneered a series of conferences. I think they were typically held every other year called Our Oceans. Uh, and, and those conferences definitely were about the ocean climate nexus, but they were about everything oceanic, about marine protected areas, about the plastic problem. Uh, and he had really quite remarkably strong and effective influence on uh, world leaders and other notable figures globally through that set of networks for four years. Uh, that, so he comes with that political capital and personal capital uh, at his disposal. Uh, I'm confident that uh, you know he'll, he'll stick to his knitting and uh, the charge that the president-elect has given him, uh, but he gets all the other dimensions as well. And I have little doubt that he'll do what he can to put an oar in the water on other key issues like, like plastic. Mm -hmm. I think he does. He is really looking at things in a more holistic way. And I thought I have, I'm, I feel very optimistic. So uh, excited about that. So next question, how might young students 13 to 18 create solutions to the challenges of ocean plastic? You know, I'll offer uh, Sylvia's a much more a closer student of, of these things, I suspect, than I am. But look, it's, I'm an engineer, so I go back to kind of first principles. Uh, there's the source term, how much is there? And, and then there's the handling term. So efforts to reduce the production of or limit the use of single use plastics, I certainly can, they need to scale, but they can come to have a significant impact. The other thing you can do, uh, and it's important to start this on a community scale, is if there's not really good active recycling programs in your community and good solid waste management, like you know, when the waste truck comes by your house and picks things up, what is done with it? Is it just dumped in an open mound somewhere where the wind can pick up the plastic and you know, blow it all off somewhere? That's commonly what happens. So you know, be an advocate in your community for sound usage, uh, you know, sound policies about having or using single use plastic and about recycling and about proper solid waste management. Keep the, keep the stuff where it belongs so it doesn't get further at hand. And by the way, since we're, we're in the month of 2020 that we are in, uh, the, one of the newer entanglement uh, and hazards for marine creatures and land creatures are the masks that we're wearing, the sanitary masks that we're wearing. When we pitch them away, break, or cut the loop that went over your ears. Uh, they are entangling birds in particular. Mm -hmm. Like the old beer can holders. Yep. They become traps. And entanglement is, is really a serious issue. And from little things, seemingly innocent things like the masks that we wear and the <laughs> plastic wraps around beer cans, but big things too, like nets hundreds of thousands of animals are killed in the ocean every year. We're talking birds, whales, fish, the whole- Seals, yep. Seals, oh, get this necklace. Oh. Anyway. I've, cut a pla I've cut a plastic necklace off two seals uh, in years past. Um, so let me- So, ask you know, when, when you take your six cans of soda or beer out, it takes you 32 seconds to snip each of those rings with a pair of scissors. Mm -hmm. Do it. But so or let you me get teeth if you have to, but do it. Let me, ask <laughs> you both the let me ask you both a question though, because really when I first started to learn about the issue of plastic pollution and the impact, my thoughts really went to, I'm gonna call these downstream solutions. 
which is really what we're talking about. Uh, but some of them right. are preventative, like investing in infrastructure that would actually reuse or recycle something or uh, downcycle it. But Sylvia and I were talking the other day about the fact that nature doesn't create any waste. That's right. So uh, maybe you could talk to that and we could talk about some ideas around prevention. So things, ways that young people could look at preventing this in the first place. Catch it before it gets out in the ocean. You know, the young boy on slot, the young man from the Netherlands, he's a teenager when he started to do something about the problems that the person who asked the question said, what can I do? And he thought big and got some support to go out into the ocean to try to gather up the plastic that was there. Well, he's now shifting his focus to catching stuff before it gets in the ocean, yeah. mouths of rivers, uh, and, and the drainage in the city, wherever you are. And ultimately, you know, yeah. all pathways lead to the sea. But, but if I could go back to the question about what can I do? I think everybody should be asking that question, no matter how many years you've piled on or, or have yet to pile on. But I think especially for kids, because you know, you're know you just at the stage of trying to figure out what direction you're going to take. And whatever it is, try to be the best you can at it, whether it's using your voice, some people sing, some people have a way with math, some people with words or with animals. That whatever it is, just be really, really, really the best you can at doing that. And then armed with that power, we all have, I, I like to think we all have superpower now because we know what we could not know when I was a kid. And even at the age of 13, you, you have shared Kathy's view of what it's like to be up in space because she's brought back that view and now it's part of you. And we now know that there's life in the deepest sea. We don't have to start from scratch. That's part of you. You've got the superpower. And armed with something that is you, that is your thing, <laughs> whatever it is, you can see the problems that we could not see before. Maybe it's something local, like organizing a cleanup. Maybe it's something more, more global, but using your talent, your power, your passion, your concern to let people see what you see and start something or be gonna, a part of something. Or I'm gonna offer, with, yeah. I'm gonna offer Go a friendly amendment uh, to what Sylvia said. Uh, and I know she, I, I'm gonna pick on one point that I know she didn't mean, but I wanna draw it out and just be clear about it. Uh, definitely look, definitely look at the things that you're passionate about and naturally talented at. Absolutely. But don't make the mistake of thinking that's all you've got. Because to, you know, to succeed at anything, whether it's getting that local recycling effort going or scaling up to something large, if your favorite best skill is math and your passion is engineering something to clean up the ocean, you're going to need to know how to communicate well. You're going to need to know how people organize, how societies and groups of people work. You might have to exercise a little harder, work a little harder to get good at and get skilled at those things. But you're going to need a basket of skills, not just the one you're naturally good at, not just your favorite one, not the one that you always loved in school and you just stay away from the ones. I, I took that class. It was hard. I'm, I'm going to run away from it. That's one of the worst mistakes people make. The total skill the basket of skills that you will thrive on and make a difference on in your teens, in your 30s, 40s, or when you're you know, ancient like Sylvia and I, that basket of skills, some of them you will have naturally. Some you will like, think of it as having to go to the gym a lot of times to get strong enough to lift that big weight or go out on the track, spend a lot of hours on the track before you can run fast enough to get that trophy. So think of it that way. Look at Think about, again, the engineer in me. If I want to make this happen, I need some, I need a device that will clean it up. I need some money to get that device built. I need some other people to help me manufacture it. What skills do I need to help pull that jigsaw puzzle together? And some will be, some will come to me easy. 
and some I will have to work at. But that's what you want to do is be a puzzle master. And so, if you don't okay. have it, then team up with somebody else who does. That's it right. Takes a community. I, I, want to, I want to challenge you both, though. I've been looking at this problem for 12, 13 years now. And I really started out by, with an approach of wanting to go out and clean up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. But in talking to Sylvia and Enrique Sala and David de Rothschild and Captain Charles Moore and all these different people who were looking at the issue of plastic and plastic pollution in the ocean, I realized that cleaning it up was not where I wanted to focus my energy. And it's part of why we came together and created the Plastic Pollution Coalition. So the idea is not just to look at, again, I'm gonna call them downstream solutions. I think they're valuable and they have a place and they're part of the solution. But in the same way that nature has evolved something to use everything, how would both of you look at this and what advice would you give particularly the students and young people who are tuning into this webinar, who are part of the Conrad challenge, who really wanna solve it at the, I call it the upstream solutions. Mm -hmm. What are systems-based solutions that we could implement that would support refill, reuse, uh, systems where we're not creating packaging garbage, you know, where, so what, what are you, what are you thinking of from that perspective? I'm curious to hear. Well, there, you know, just... there are movements underway. You're more, uh, more developed and more active in Europe at the moment uh, than they are in either uh, Asia or the United States. Uh, largely, broadly under the heading circular economy, that's one part of it. So you, you don't throw things off you know, all the time. You're reusing uh, in various ways, refill it, reuse it, recycle it. Uh, yeah, I mean, cardboard boxes are a pretty good example of that. Most of the, you get an Amazon box these days, probably 97% of the fiber in that box is recycled. It's not the first, it, this did not go from tree to box to trash can. It went from tree to box to trash to pulp to box like seven, eight, nine times. Uh, that's not zero waste, but it's, you know, it's a multi-cycle reuse. Uh, is it really impossible to find chemical engineering pathways that let us do that with plastics? There's never been either the regulatory uh, driver or the economic incentive to really dig in and look at that. Uh, perhaps that time is coming. Perhaps someone on our call right now can be the chemical engineering wizard. In fact, the Pritzker Emerging Environmental Genius Prize, I think it was two years ago, uh, went to a young gal, uh, a college age, university age young woman in uh, the Bay Area of uh, California that has come up with a new chemical process that actually can break down, just like the box example, break pretty sophisticated plastics down to the raw materials that let them go in the front end to become a, some other plastic device. Um, so, uh, but these are you know, early nascent steps and what they all need will require to get to scale because human beings being what they are and the ways we organize our societies and economies being what they are, they will need uh, grassroots political pressure and or consumer demand and or uh, regulatory drivers and or economic triggers or thresholds or incentives to get them to a scale that matters. So I think we ought to get some economists on the case and do some honest accounting because we're not, we think of plastics as cheap goods. You know, you wrap everything with them and you think that they're so convenient and they're so inexpensive and all of that. We're not accounting for the real cost. Everybody pays the real cost of the downstream. Sylvia, and we, we don't account for real environmental costs in any segment of our economy. It's not true. just plastic. I know. Fish are free, another example. But so we need to face up to the reality. That's going way upstream, Diana. <laughs> and getting the, the people who are actually making this stuff, making money mm -hmm. and not on, without accounting for the real cost. And we're all complicit in this because we think it's cheap and, but we're not paying the real cost either. 
when we use what seems to be a really convenient thing. So there are a number of ways to get at this, but at least we have begun to identify the problems. Mm -hmm. If we didn't know, that would be the biggest problem. And you're, you're doing it, Diana, with getting the organization, getting people aware, and then challenging them to come up with solutions as you are. I mean, we've got a problem with whatever it is, uh, maybe close to 8 billion people, but we've got 8 billion minds. Somebody's going to come up with solutions now that we've identified the problems. But we just have to hurry. We have to really think about it and realize these goods are not cheap. They're among the most expensive kinds of materials that are being produced because of the down, downstream cost. So we need to, everybody can do something about that. But I think you're, I think you're both really right. And um, the, the true costs in, on so many levels, but particularly when we look at our use of single use plastics, all of the true costs have been externalized. Yeah, so, <laughs> it means we all pay. Yeah. yeah, so basically the responsibility for these materials has been put onto the public. Uh, and, and to uh, the fish and the birds and the whales and- Yeah, it's actually, been, it's been put onto the planet, not onto the public. Yeah, that's right, exactly so. Uh, and because um, they last a long time, it's not just today's planet, it's, you know, Hello, future. It's still there. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to say we we actually have a, about almost twenty more minutes, nineteen more minutes for this conversation. But Kathy, I know you have to jump because you are highly in demand. So I was right. So if, <laughs> I know Sylvia is too. But Sylvia, if you'll stick with us, Kathy, I would just love to give you an opportunity to send a message out to all the folks who are tuning into this and particularly the students. Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll go back to a point that I made earlier uh, and, and it's just sort of the, the uh, you know, the space cadet way of, of making you know, Sylvia's point. And that is uh, take care of your life support system. Uh, while you're busy with your everyday and thinking of the short term and, you know, the maybe the bottom line in your business or the convenience, uh, all the little things we think about every day. This is, this is what I think comes back to earth with astronauts who've been in orbit. All the little stuff we fritter with every day. How quick can I do something? How convenient, how inexpensive? It's 20 cents more, it's a dollar more. Those become big things to us when we live you know, with this horizon in the day to day. And when you got above the planet and you see it as uh, from our distance, it was a beach ball. Uh, and you, you come to understand what an exquisite uh, system of systems it is and how completely, utterly dependent on the health of those systems we are. Uh, so the natural systems of this planet and every other form of life on this planet, they are all part of our life support system. Uh, and I think to start, you know, to start thinking about just the local environment around you and how you interact with it with that mindset. To start thinking about where you might want to apply your skills or passions or talents for a career with that mindset. Because as Sylvia commented, you know, there's seven, there are 7.7 .7 billion minds on this planet right now, but there are not 2 billion of them that have committed to applying their energies to figuring out how to change this equation. How do we connect economic decision making to these practices in a way that brings the true cost, the full cost into focus. How do we do that? Some economist is going to do that. Some prime minister or president is going to do that. Some CEO of a major company is going to be the leader who does that. Is that, is that the avenue you want to go down and make the difference from that side of the equation? The scientist that helps understand the implications and maybe advises local community or environmental managers how to mitigate, uh, how to you know overcome the problems. So we need all of these things. It's a it's a full team effort, working I think at basically every single niche in the ecosystem of the plastic problem and the ocean acidification problem. Mm -hmm. So 
if, if you just come to fall in love with the planet or get as committed to preserving your life support system as I was aboard a space shuttle, uh, and and be sure be sure part or part or all of your career is helping to make that happen. Be that be that Mr. or Mrs. Fix It because we're going to need a lot of them and we're going to need them in a lot of those different places as spokespeople, as bankers, as business people, as legislators and heads of state uh, and grassroots organizers. Well, and Thank also, you. Kathy, sorry, uh, what about in terms of implementing policy that support these ideas? Hmm. Do you have well, I, I mean, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Policy gets implemented when forces come from many avenues and angles. Uh, policy is not uh, an edict that one person on high came up with and levies on everyone else, at least not in the political system of the United States of America. So there are you know, many niches, many perches from, from which you can have an impact on this problem uh, at different scales. Uh, and we need smart and committed and dedicated, passionate people in, in as many of those places as possible who, who appreciate what we've learned over the last 50 years, who deeply get the fact that we're talking about the life support system for this entire planet, which means all of humankind and every other form of life on this planet. So it is both intensely personal and, and very intensely about the greater good of all of us. So if I could just yeah. keep you long enough to underscore that life support is clearly has to be on your mind when you're up in space, but it's also true when you're down in the ocean. Absolutely. Little, little submarine. Absolutely. <laughs> Even scuba yeah, diving. Exactly. But, yeah, but absolutely. Just... Yeah, and you have to know how it works. You have to master it. Uh, yeah. And you know, so just want to pick up on that one. When, when I scuba dive, uh, when I fly an airplane um, in the submersible, it's, you absolutely know about it and mastered it. You're paying attention to it. But we do the same thing in those environments that we're criticizing humankind for doing. You, you become so familiar with your scuba gear and whether it's working <laughs> right now. That, <laughs> that it's, well, no, I was not going to go to complacent. It fades to back of mind. Mm. And the experience of being there in the ocean, your enjoyment, that becomes your front of mind experience. We're doing, we do a version of that in our day-to-day -day life on the planet. The life support system that is keeping us alive, we don't think about. So we think about the super convenience of having three cars in my garage so everyone can drive wherever they want, whenever they want. And we don't worry about the acidification of the ocean. And we think about the ease of picking up you know, dinner at the takeout in a plastic bag with plastic utensils because it's, it's simple and easy. And I don't have to wash up and that's wonderful. And we don't think about the consequences downstream. So it's a very, it, it is a quintessentially natural human thing to do, which is part of what makes these problems so hard to overcome. No, and it's not the, the, it's not the evil of humankind doing this. It's the, it's the natural behavioral patterns of humankind. Well, I can excuse the, the, what seems like bad behavior of those 50, 100 or whatever it is years ago who started this trend toward a degraded planet. But Kathy, I think we've got to get tough. <laughs> there's yeah, no but, that's, but that's the challenge of, there's a 50 year battleship. <laughs> the, the, the mass of 50 years moving in that direction. That's and, right. And turning that, turning that is hard. But the knowledge is there. The, the real problem is, okay, how many people really know what you know and are convinced I think the audience we're addressing, they're pretty much on board. Part of the problem is getting the knowledge, the evidence that is there. We know what to do. We need to get more people really up to speed, take care of the planet that takes care of us as a priority, not just as an afterthought. Because I've, I've, I've never, never met a human being that changes a deeply patterned behavior because they heard something or learned something. They change because of experience. Yeah, that's probably well. The the good you, you became you became you because of experience, not because of scientific facts that you learned along the way. 
Now, what you can what you can do now, if the stage of your life armed with those scientific facts is far more powerful than if you just stayed that thirteen year old uh, skin diving girl. But but th that's... I want everybody to see what I've seen, what you've seen. That I think one of the the saving aspects of our present time is we're doing this with the Zoom right now. You, when you were up in space, shared the view. I haven't been up in space, but I've seen it through your eyes. And you're, you have communicated in ways that are not the total experience. I think you do have to be there to do that. But this year, this year when we are gathering vicariously as never before, um, Bob Ballard tried to make that point some years ago about remote education. And I said, he yeah. was just ahead of his time. And we need, we need both. Yep. We need kids to get out and get wet. We need anybody who can get up in the air and see what you've seen. Yes, but you should be obliged to share the view so that you can get others to mm, feel it and know it as well. And then respect what keeps us alive and then do what we can do to keep the world alive. Um, both of you, uh, Nancy Conrad was asking us again, just for parting thoughts about how young students, 13 to 18, can approach creating solutions. And I'm asking for front end upstream kinds of engineer solutions that would match with the Conrad challenge. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to let Sylvia take that one and hop off because I have to flip to another call. I'm right. sorry. But thank you all for joining. I hope you take some sparks of inspiration away. Uh, Nancy, I'm sure you're on here somewhere. And uh, thank you, as always, for sparking the creativity and, and setting a grand challenge to our young folks. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what comes out of it in the end. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kathy. Sylvia. So I'm hard pressed to tell anybody else <laughs> what to do. My advice is look in the mirror. First of all, get, get up to speed with what the problems are. You, whoever you are, are better suited to address this piece of the problem or that piece or working with somebody else to to take it on, but it's a little presumptuous for me to get inside your skin and look out. I mean, I can try, but the best person to answer the question that's being posed is look at yourself, look in the mirror and be mindful of what others are doing. And maybe you can say, I can do that, or I can do that better, or I can, come up with something totally different that nobody's thought of yet. But it's, it's not fair to push it off on me, say, what can I do? I say, I'm gonna push it right back to you and say, <laughs> think about it. Well, because, I was, and you're I was gonna, doing something already by thinking about it. I was gonna add to what you're saying too. I know that when I first really began to learn about the problem of plastic in the ocean, and that's really where I first noticed it and began to become aware of it. Um, one of the first things I did was I tried to come up with my own plan. And then I tried to reach out to others to get their advice and their wisdom. Uh, and then when I realized my plan wasn't a great idea, I went back to the drawing board but I also looked around to see who else was doing what to see if I could join forces with them. Right. If there was something interesting already happening that That's I right. could align with. So because you also, as you, from an engineering perspective, if you're trying to come up with a new idea, you want to know what else is available and out there right. as you're developing your concept. So I think that's the advice, the kind of advice I would share. With the new generation that are and, and don't think that it's impossible we we really some things are we cannot go back and what we have put into the ocean into the atmosphere into space that's a fact it's a given but we can go forward armed with what we now know 
and make things better. I, th I think having lived through this time of immense discovery and immense loss, I think right on the edge of immense transition to recovery, it's really exciting to be around when I see so many people energized because what we now know that we couldn't know before and to see that it matters and that individuals can make a difference. In fact, it's only individuals who do. I mean, it starts with someone doing something and then teaming up with somebody else, sharing the view. Sylvia, you were the one who said, if I could be anywhere and make a difference and do something, I would want to be here. Now, that's right. Because it's not too late now. We are armed with knowledge. The superpowers that we've got that didn't exist and could not exist before. But if we wait much longer, we're going to lose the chance in so many ways. We've already lost so many species because of our ignorance and indifference, not knowing, not caring. But I see this, this really, this almost a, a wave of new way of thinking that did not exist as much when I was a child as it does among today's kids and even the grown-ups of today. But the kids are really special. I think perhaps because they have grown up knowing what could not be known before, seeing problems that we didn't know we had before, and knowing this is the world they are going to occupy. And looking at the trends doesn't look really good if we keep doing what we've been doing. We can do better than this. So they're ready to do something better than what's been done before. Yeah, just looking back to the 1950s and then the 40s, you know, the nuclear power was used to end a war. But oh, the cost, when you think about it, when you think about what things that people weren't thinking about at the time, just the testing of nuclear weapons, blowing up entire islands in the Pacific, ecosystems, the place where people had a deep culture just evaporated. Not the people, they moved the people away, but they evaporated their homes. <laughs> Would we ethically, morally be prepared to do that in the 21st century? Well, we're doing some pretty terrible things, but by knowing of the past, we can make decisions that make for a better future. And that's what gives me cause for hope. I agree with you a thousand percent, Sylvia, and I could talk to you all night, but we have to wrap up. And I want to thank you for making this time and for this conversation. It feels for me, obviously very intimate uh, to, and so I feel so fortunate to have this time and share with everyone else, you and Kathy's uh, experience and wisdom. So thank you. Um, thank you very much to both of you for being thank a part. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of the action. Thank you. And I'd like to say to everyone who joined us today, thank you so much for joining. And to ask you to please tune in for our next webinar, which will be on Wednesday, January 27th, starting at 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time, Plastic Pollution Coalition's uh, managing Director Julia Cohen will be having a conversation with Dr. Phil Landrigan. He's the Director of the Program for Global Public Health and the Common Good at Boston College. And they'll be talking about his new report, Global Human Health and Ocean Pollution. So please sign up and join us. And we also, we invite you to get involved with us. If you're not a member of our coalition, please join us. We invite you to connect with us on social media to learn more. And we will be sending out a link to a survey. We'd love to get your feedback on this webinar. Big thanks to everyone for joining us today. And we'll include the links to all of the things that we showed. So thank you very much.